Um, well, today, another part of the support area in Goddard that doesn't get attention is the library. And, you know, the library is no longer the 20th century library. And with the digital revolution and all of that, the library has changed uh, dramatically. Now, I asked uh, Michael Chesnus, who you've all seen if you've been in the library over the last decade or so, because he'll be at the front desk. I asked Michael to come out and tell us what's, uh, what's, uh, what the new library is all about. Uh, Michael, he, he's uh, spent, uh, what, 12 years as, as a science reference librarian at, at Goddard. He's now the deputy program manager for select federal services. Um, he uh, had got his master's in library information studies from the University of Rhode Island. Anyway, Michael, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Arlen, and it's really good to be here, and I see some familiar faces, and hopefully some more faces will be familiar after today. We'd love to hear from all of you. <clears throat> As Arlen said, my name is Michael Chesnes, and I'm the Deputy Program Manager for the Select Federal Contract at Goddard. Uh, and as Arlen said, the library has evolved over the years, and in recent years, in some other ways. Uh, we went through a significant uh, renovation of our physical space uh, from mid-2015 to early 2016, and we were, we were actually housed in the 16W warehouse before that building came down during that renovation. Uh, so uh, the interior you see of the library dates from that renovation, and we went to a new paradigm at that point where our interior space was the Goddard Information and Collaboration Center, the GIC Squared. So that is a multi-purpose conference space with reconfigurable furniture. There are dividers with whiteboards where people, they write equations, they brainstorm. There are monitors that have USB dongles that sync to people's laptops. Uh, the monitors come in a few different shapes and sizes, and people can host different size events, and we can uh, bring in the movers from tracks to roll around some of the furniture into different configurations uh, depending on exactly what people are booking in the space. There are some other changes coming which are not fully fleshed out yet, uh, but what we know for sure at this point is that the NASA libraries are moving towards a greater interoperability amongst themselves and most of them will be uh, under the Office of Communications in a new group out of headquarters called the Inf History and Information Services Division. So that will have history, archives, FOIA, library, all together into a single parent organization. And one uh, manifestation of that is we've gotten to know the Goddard Office of Communications quite a bit better in recent months and have been at their staff meetings and are working together more and more with them. <coughs> So there are some semantics that I need to clear up because there's, there's quite a bit of branding uh, here. Um, and so the GIC squared, they, that's the big rectangle you see near the center of the screen, uh, that refers to our physical plant, our physical space. If you go into building 21 above the cafeteria, you see this multi-purpose conference space with the you know, the traditional book stacks uh, off to the side of it. You see an information desk that handles reference and circulation. Uh, unlike some academic libraries or some public libraries, we run reference and circulation out of a single desk. Uh, you will see different uh, bistro tables and movable furniture. We call that the GSC Square, but the GSC Square also refers to our organization as a whole. Uh, more when we were in Code 272, say from 2016 to several months ago, uh, you know, we would, you know, the archives and the library were in a, a single cohesive administrative unit. We are evolving out of that paradigm, but we still sometimes within our staff use GSC Square to refer to our organization as well as that space. Um, NASA Goddard Library is a particular, the NASA Goddard Library is a particular function of the GIC Square organization located in the GIC Square space, and that is 
the staff members of the library and the skills that they provide, as well as the physical materials, as well as the subscriptions, as well as the services we provide to the community. Uh, we do have a close working relationship with the NASA Goddard Archives, and I think some of you have been in touch with our archivists. The archives, like the library, are evolving to an enterprise-wide model, so we are still closely connected with them, but not quite in the same way. Um, the NASA Goddard Library also produces something called the Goddard Institutional Repository, and that is patterned after the kind of uh, academic repositories you would see created by an academic library, where they try to uh, capture the literature produced by their institution, that is something we do. We have some specialized collections, uh, a blue document collection, a Landsat collection, a Colloquia collection, the God of News collection. Uh, these are different. We also have authors and publications, uh, which is one of our most popular, possibly our two most popular collections. I have to ask about that. Uh, but they're in very great demand because since we began a harvesting process from major scholarly databases in 2009 with some limited retrospective content that we would try to grow over time, we've created a resource that is of greater and greater value where uh, we can go into scholarly databases and pick out the citations of you know, Goddard authors of what they've published, but in a way that standardizes the way their names are rendered and the way that their organizations within Goddard are rendered. So we can look in a very precise way with a very high level of accuracy and see who and which codes you know, produce which literature and get some citation metrics at the, the branch level, at the division level, at the directorate level. And this kind of literature is, the, this kind of uh, bibliometrics, this measurement of literature, is in, has been in greater and greater demand in recent years. <clears throat> so, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, we, are, uh, we have migrated from Code 272 to Code 130, and we are now within the Office of Communications. Uh, and then, the, then with libraries, uh, with archives, history, and FOIA, we are within the Agent ISD, which is uh, within the Office of Communications at a headquarters level. <clears throat> All right, so information services, that is the, it's the heart of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and it is, also, um, it is also the most visible library service, because that's what you see when you come in. Um, you know, you, you see someone at the desk, you see librarians on the floor maybe helping out with one of the events taking place in the JC Squared space. Uh, so information services, it includes looking up things, answering and answering questions, and performing research, but it also includes uh, outreach events like this, or when we had big public events like the Science Jamboree, um, which you see in one of these photos on the, the lower left-hand side. Um, we make ourselves known to the Goddard community that you know, here we are, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is what our capabilities are, and um, that, that is a big part of what we do. Uh, before the pandemic, we had a regular presence in Building 33 and Building 34 as part of a program called the Mobile Librarian. So that is on hold right now, but we are looking for ways of reinventing it, reinvigorating it. Uh, what you see, some, um, what we did was something like what you see in the upper left, where one of us would sit at a table, we had permission from the building phones to set up tables in building 33 and building 34, where we had the best results, so we concentrated on those buildings. And people would come to us, and it was a sort of miniature library where we could be a first point of contact with the <coughs> population. Because people would see us passing by, and they would love to talk to us. They would always have something to say. Um, and also, we, we have public events. And this includes um, the COVID era, where we've been doing a lot of teleworking. Um, we've had both in-person events where vendor representatives would come and speak to us. But we've also had um, you know, virtual events where vendor representatives or even people 
from elsewhere in NASA, like from the standards program, who are curators of information can come and speak to us. And we can sometimes get dozens of people uh, interested in those sessions. All right, so there are a few different ways of getting in touch with us. Um, this is our home page. It's visible from inside the firewall. Uh, and you can also write to us at this email, this um, DL email, uh, for which we've had for maybe a couple years. You can reach us from outside the firewall. That way you can reach us by calling also. Uh, if you can get to our home page, you can also click a little question mark in the upper right, and that gets us to, uh, that gets you to a web form that or the library staff can see. So, um, you know, any one of a number of people could get back to you that way. We do have a Facebook presence. Uh, just maybe a few months ago, we had our first reference question by Facebook. So if our content is not set up for that, we talk about different goings on within DAR, within NASA, and sometimes things that are relevant in the space community, maybe relevant to our um, you know, our, our core audience at Goddard. Uh, but, you know, you can certainly contact us that way. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about what information services are. Sometimes they are what we call known item searches, where people know, they know exactly what they want, but they can't get to the full text. So maybe we need to scan it from them, uh, scan it for them from a print journal. Or maybe we need to request it from another library, or maybe even one of the other NASA libraries has it within their collection. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, we have interlibrary loan, and we have some in-depth search where we can search for a topic rather than a specific document, and the results are unknown, harder to predict. They may be more or less in quantity than what you expect, which is always an answer even if you get less than what you expect, that is still very much an answer. Uh, so sometimes the, the in-depth searches can, um, they can be coming up with a curriculum vitae for a long-time researcher, a senior researcher. They can be an overview of a single topic, for instance, when interns are here in the summer and they have maybe 10 weeks and they're working in a team or a project, like some of the developed interns that are science projects, we can move quickly at the beginning of the summer. That tends to be our busiest part of the year uh, to make sure that the intern teams have what they want so that they can work on their projects in a timely manner. Uh, sometimes we look at research impact of a particular mission, of a particular instrument, of um, you know, of a particular organization within Goddard. But we can also, you know, there's also an historical component to what we do, and in recent years that is in collaboration with the archives, uh, because they, they take a lead now on the historical searching, but sometimes there are things we can do to help them out, especially looking in some of the databases of peer-reviewed literature. We have had several projects where we've completed spreadsheets for people. The most, the most intricate, complicated ones have been one of exoplanet orbit parameters, orbital parameters, and another one of um, conditions under which extremophiles live. You know, the, you know, looking through professional literature to figure out, you know, how much salinity they're known to handle, how much pH they're known to handle, how much pressure. Uh, so we've, and, and we've had a few materials uh, ones also. So that custom spreadsheet work is uh, something we've been involved with at various times in the past. Um, <clears throat> when we look at research impact, a lot of the requests we get have a uh, visual component to them, either looking at the impact of a single influential paper and how that's propagated over time, uh, which is what you see on the left-hand side. There was a single very influential paper from 1979 that was cited and cited and cited in many ways that were very influential throughout the decades. Um, what you see on the right-hand side was something that one of, uh, my predecessors did using a program uh, called Voss Viewer, uh, which is uh, another network visualization tool. And what you see in the middle is something I did with a tool called Quid, and that uh, was uh, uh, published recently in a paper in 
a remote sensing society and environment where I was a, a co-author who contributed to the network analysis of um, ISAT mission applications for ISAT and ISAT 2. So these are some samples of the different tools we use. Um, if you are looking for content um, behind the firewall, uh, I would start with either Web of Science or ProQuest. If you're outside of the firewall, you can also access the astrophysics data system, which aims to be very comprehensive for astronomy and goes into uh, you know, geophysics, goes into instrumentation, uh, so you, you'll get a, a lot of AGU publication, uh, AGU publications indexed in there, even if they're not strictly astronomical. Uh, sometimes you'll get some of the engineering society publications. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. We have uh, some full text society databases. Um, we have some visualization tools we use. If you're doing a lot of research, I always recommend to use a citation manager. That could be Zotero, that could be Mendeley. That's a tool where you can grab citations from different uh, sources, different databases, and you can export them into a file in a format like RIS, for instance, that the citation manager will read. The citation manager will index those uh, search results from different databases, even if they were originally formatted differently, and it will standardize the format and display them almost like the way an email client would, where you can see a list of citations, you can organize them in folders, you can have projects where you share those citations with other people. So if you're working with uh, published literature in bulk, that is something that speeds up the work you do. Whoop, success stories. Um, so some of the success stories that happened were supporting the 60th anniversary of Goddard, um, you know, the exoplanet spin orbit misalignment, which was that big spreadsheet I told you about, um, titanium oxide and chromium properties, um, the DEVELOP interns, uh, that is a NASA Earth Science program that has been running for several years now, where teams of Earth Science interns um, come in at uh, other centers besides Goddard, but they, they come in at Goddard, I think, three times a year. And we've helped several DEVELOP teams now with searches in Elka City flooding, with um, insect pests in, the, in upstate New York. Uh, we've helped some other intern teams, for instance, uh, with the Pandora spectrophotometer. Um, and I think recently there was a arid land, some sort of arid land intern team, and I'm pretty sure they were developed as well. So um, we've helped them quite a lot. There are spacecraft modeling interns. Uh, there's been a project for several years where students from MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art, have uh, come to us with their mentors, and we've supported them over successive summers in researching early space missions, uh, you know, US and Russian missions, and trying to figure out how many photographs can we find of them. Can we find photographs on the ground? Can we find photographs where they're loaded into the rockets so we have a pretty good idea of what the final configuration was like? Do we have photographs of their models, of you know, papers that have measurements or, or you know, physical characteristics um, so we can, you know, so the students can do a better job coming up with these 3D models and they can be of greater value to future researchers. So our connections, uh, a lot of us within the staff are professionally active. The two major librarian organizations are the American Library Association and the Special Libraries Association. Uh, the one I, that most of my activity has been in has been the Special Libraries Association, especially in the Physics, Astronomy, Math division, which is called PAM. Um, SLA is likely to undergo some major evolution or changes uh, in, the, in the coming years, but uh, the, the PAM network has been truly exceptional and a lot of my role models as librarians are in that organization. Um, we are active at professional conferences like one called Computers and Libraries that's in the DC area every year. We are active on listservs. Uh, like the PAM listserv, like the listserv that the NASA librarians are on. So we, you know, we are very well connected to the other NASA libraries and frequently talk to them. And they frequently help us answer questions. We help them. We've had some fairly intricate search projects where 
you know, with some of these in-depth searches that I've described, where librarians from multiple multiple NASA libraries have come together. And we also, you know, we help out other libraries from other aerospace institutions, you know, even outside of NASA or with other government agencies and academic libraries, and they help us as well. So trends, these are some of the things that we're likely to see in librarianship in recent years, and we have um, partaken of some of these ourselves. Uh, one trend you'll see more of is open access. Uh, you're starting to see more and more federal mandates for publicly accessible scientific data and publicly accessible scientific research. There's a lot of interest in the last decade or so in having beautiful data, like some of what you see over here. And with some of the visualization that we've done, we are migrating more towards that beautiful data paradigm. Um, <clears throat> Citing data sets is of great interest, uh, especially in earth science, but it's in the sciences in general. Uh, scientometrics, so looking not just at peer-reviewed literature, counting literature like bibliometrics, but looking at, you know, looking at data sets, looking at uh, partnerships, funding, whatever can be measured about scientific collaboration. Uh, that, that's becoming more important. Having data geographically marked and displayed is, is a, an important trend. Institutional repositories, like the one that we work on at Goddard. Um, oh, um, also, I'm searching for collaborators and searching for funders. Uh, so when we meet with our vendor reps from the companies that um, our databases come from, that's something that they like to show to us in their search tools. So there's, there's definitely a lot of appetite for that, and you may, uh, you may see some more of that back caught in, uh, in years to come. So thank you very much. Uh, I am assuming there will be quite a bit of Q&A, and I will be here to, uh, as long as you need me, to answer your questions. Uh, a few of them I've heard already and will answer. Uh, I heard that for a while the retirees were not able to come on site. Um, retirees can come on site now. We have a computer within the library that is set up to have a waiver. So even if you don't have a, a chip on your smart card, um, we can log you into that computer. You can get to our databases, you can get to our catalog. You can also use the physical materials in the library. Yesterday that computer was down, but we expect it to be up and running again very soon. So um, you are definitely welcome within our doors and, uh, and call by all means. Uh, some of the questions we receive uh, are of uh, an archival nature. So uh, we may, you know, we may uh, sense that the archives can do more to help with the materials at their disposal than we can do to help with the materials at our disposal, but we certainly work closely with them and some of uh, the searches we've done have um, complemented the searches they have done. So certainly ask us, uh, even if we refer it to another NASA library or another organization within Goddard, we are very much willing to help. Um, so please, you know, just let us know what you need. What is a smart card? Oh, it's uh, the ID badge with the little chip in it. Oh, like, that's the Goddard ID badge. Right, the Goddard ID badge. Also, if you're a retiree, you don't have one. I don't think the retiree badges have chips. No. The, no, the emeritus no. ones do. Yeah, no. They don't. So um, they can't use anything that's required. Um, once, once that computer I mentioned is fixed uh, the way it was before the holidays, you should be able to come in and you, you know, we can get you online. So I'll, I'll make sure I contact my coworkers and let them know there's quite a bit of interest in that. And uh, I'll see if we, we can get that computer online again. There was something, something wasn't quite right with it yesterday, but before the holidays, we were able to get retirees online, no problem. So what building is that? Uh, it's in 21. It's above the big main cafeteria in the credit union. Yes, it's, yes, it's the, the, the old library. Parts of it look uh, 
quite similar. The book stacks look quite similar. The downstairs area, and you can see little tiny photos of it uh, within the slide deck, uh, but the downstairs area uh, had a pretty substantial makeover. The marble tables went to different spots on center. There were these, there were beloved oval, oval marble tables that two people had to move. We had a special cart with a jig on it where two of us could wheel them around and the, the tops actually came off. So those went to different places. I think there are a couple of them in Building 33, for instance. Uh, so those are there within the library. Uh, but there is a lot there that you would recognize in terms of the physical resources and in terms of the kind of service you would get at the desk. Is it okay if we publish the uh, contact information that were in your slides in our newsletter? Yes, yes, go, go ahead. If you read the newsletter, you'll know how to contact and the, the slides got a little um, distorted where the lines overlapped. Um, I'm going to have you work with me on that. Yes, yes, but uh, you know, use, use my, my phone number, my email, because I, I am fairly visible in the library community. I'm active in LinkedIn, I'm active in SLA, so I'm not hidden by any means. So, you know, come find me if you need me. You can, you can share my contact info. Yes, and I'll answer yours in just a minute. Cynthia. Two things. Um, did you mention the, the steps that the uh, folks will be looking at and then Matthew found information about the group for the grandfather? I thought that was interesting. Is that Jessica? Does she work with you? Uh, yes, Jessica is, uh, Jess is one of our archivists. And uh, I have been uh, CC'd with uh, I think with Jess and Christine on some of these emails. So between us, we will pursue this question. And I know our, our branch head, Robin Dixon, is very interested in this question also. That's just, I mean, she said she checked different places. How did, you, how did she know where to go? That was my basic question. Where the steps are that she's able to take? Uh, they they have a different catalog than we do, so I, I don't know what all the steps are. Uh, and, and they have a different physical collection than we have. Uh, so I, you would you would have to ask her. Uh, but there I mean I can for me I would search, you know, if I you know, for me supporting their side of the search, I would search in some of those databases that I flashed the icons of on the screen. Um, like the, the um, SDI repository that used to be called NTRS, it used to be called Recon. I would look in there, I would look in Web of Science, ProQuest, ADS, um, maybe some of the Engineering Society databases, um, you know, there you know, a few others. There are some search tools I can use on my end, but they are different search tools than the archives uh, has. Are the better news? Um, they are in the institutional repository, and we are looking at making the institutional repository public again. It was public facing several years ago, and our intention is to try to make it um, public facing again. There's some work we need to do that we have been doing on our end to make that come about, but our intention is for them to be public facing again. And they are, you know, they are indexed where you can search for specific topics and, you know, you, you know, you can get to those articles. Okay. All right, thanks. And, and you had a question. Yeah, um, I used to get into Cover Library. I had a VPN that was accessed. I get into to Goddard do you have at this point? Right now? I used to be able to 
get into the library okay. with my VPN running on my own PC at home. Okay. But that was, I lost that when the security levels went up. So okay. I can't, I don't, don't even have the VPN anymore. So my question is, will I ever be able to look at journals, articles, and card libraries? I, I don't think you would unless you were uh, an emeritus or a contractor. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a retired and I'm a contractor. And a, you also have a, a NASA email address. Yes. Right, right, right. Yes. I don't have a NASA email. I have a NASA contractor card. I have a NASA contractor badge. But I no longer have a NASA email address. Are you... Are you... Um, are, are you active? Um, are you contractor part time? Okay, you work for contractor part time. Are Are you active in the directory right now? In the directory, like if if I looked you up, um, you know what I mean. I, I think the answer is no, but I'll, I'll exchange contact info with you and see if there is some way through your contractor. Um, I, so yes, my, my suspicion is the answer is no, but I'll see if there is some way, some connection that, that can make that happen. Okay, so your com your computer is not a, a NASA computer. Right. Hmm. That's hard. Well, let's, no, I, I let's, have a, a let's, Goddard computer, and yet I can't get to internal on Goddard because I don't have a NASA email address. Okay. It's as simple as that. Yeah. 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 All right, let, let's, let's talk later. I'll, um, okay. uh, sure. And Bob, Bob. Basically related to that question, that the person who has had no experience with NASA or Goddard, they can't come in and do a search on the journal. Right? If, if they had a way of getting on center, they could. So, From home, they can't outside. And they can't, they can't just take that website and go to the library and do a search. Uh, right now, no. If we get the repository to be public facing again, there is some content in there that you would be able to search. Um, but um, the, the subscriptions, no, you wouldn't be able to get at the subscriptions. Yeah, the the uh, guider telephone books are uh, one of the most valuable resources to us here. And keeping track of the obituaries out of that. Right now, you have to ask us, you know, each request one by one. We don't have them searchable uh, currently. Uh, possibly at some point in the future we might, but that's that's not my call to make. Uh, but for now, you would, you would have to ask us, you know, I'm interested in what this code was during this year, and then we could look it up and we can get back to you. Any other questions? So, same question on the daughter director of weeklets from decades ago. How can I search for that? Which directories? Oh, Gutter Directors Weekly. Ooh, I'm not familiar with that one. That's, ooh, Gutter Directors Weekly. I, I would, I would talk to the archivists. I, I am not familiar with that publication. That's, that sounds like it's a very important one that, that slipped under my radar. Yeah. Okay, do you know, do you know roughly what time span that was? Uh, do you know which, roughly what time span it was published? Well, from 61 to 95. 61 to 95, okay. I will, I will ask the archivists about that. I will, 
I will see. Um, before I go, if you want, exchange emails with me, and I can get in touch with you. Sure. Well, let's thank our speaker again.